Uh, can you give me a brief summary of how you ended up at Resolution Care? Yeah, well, how did Resolution Care end up happening? Yeah. 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 So the way that I think about our genesis is that Resolution Care as a way of taking care of people kind of arose from my frustrations and burnout and naive disappointment in how healthcare promised to be for people that were facing the greatest challenge of life, which is to lose it. Um, the disappointment with how it was and how I thought it would be and how it really turned out to be. So over the course of my career, since I launched into my doctorhood in 1996, um, I dealt with a series of periods of burnout. I just figured, wow, I'll just work really, really hard, buy into the whole status quo. What um, were some of the primary obstacles of the status quo of healthcare? Yeah, I think what, what happened for me is that what people needed, what people were telling me that they needed and showing me that they needed and what they were responding to when I provided it was that people want to be seen as the person they are, not the problems they have. People want to be treated with a certain kind of respect that comes when you don't look at them as just the next name on a list or a consumer of healthcare or a complex of interesting disease states. People don't want to be seen that way. They want to be seen the way they see themselves, which is as a person, as a mother, as a brother, as a whatever it is that they are. And the things that are most important to them, they'd like to know that those things are important to us. And then the system is meant to optimize the purely medical dimension of who people are. Which is their illness, cholesterol. Right? What's that? Which is their illness. Right? Which is their illness, which is lowering their, or their prevention or lowering their cholesterol and making sure that they've got their colonoscopy or their flu shots or their pneumovax and all the rest of it. All of that stuff is absolutely beneficial to aggregate populations of people. But populations of people never walk into an exam room right. looking for help. It's people that come in. Individuals, not populations. And that struggle um, led me to a series of burnouts. I started out uh, working in the incredible Open Door Community Health System. Um, and for the first seven years, I took care of a lot of the most complicated patients and uh, a lot of HIV patients and a lot of people that needed uh, extra attention to understand what their medical issues were. Doing like generalized medicine? General internal okay. medicine, okay. primary care. Okay. Right? But after a while, that became the stresses on the organization to ensure that everybody saw as many people as possible to keep the lights on, to keep the, yeah. the organization solid. That productivity pressure, that sort of industrial crank it out was harder for me because I wanted to take a lot more time with people who were uh, complex in their either illness or their life or whatever it was. And I wanted to spend the time that they wanted me to spend with them. So that was kind of a difficult match and it was a burnout path. And I worked um, overlapping with that at Hospice of Humboldt. Uh, organization that is a very well-structured and robust palliative care program for the very end of life. But we would see people for such a short period of time, and they would come to us after sometimes many years of progressive decline, more burden of symptoms, more challenging choice making, and you know, cancer diagnosis, and all the stuff that they've been navigating without the kind of support that they need and that I wanted to provide. So that um, was limited. And then I started the 
uh, palliative care consultation service in the hospital. And that provided that kind of person-centered, multiple points of view kind of approach to people who were sick enough to be hospitalized. So during the time that they were hospitalized, I would work with our social workers, sometimes nurses, the chaplain, and we would provide wraparound services for three days or five okay. days or seven days. I could see how that would be frustrating. And then out they go right. with very limited supportive structures. Um, so after the most recent version of burnout where I just couldn't sustain doing it. Uh, burnout for you is just, I need to take a month off. Or... Burnout for me was, I was getting irritable. Okay. I was not taking care of myself. People were thinking I was an asshole yeah. because <laughs> I was an asshole. And so why, is, why is his patience so thin? Why is he so reactive? Mm. Why is he not listening? You know. And then I'd leave my house and my family and I'd get the same stuff at work, right? Yeah. So th it, it means that I'm not the best version of myself. Right. And that allowed to continue, it looks like it looks for lots of doctors and nurses and people in society that are trying to do more than they actually can do. It looks like, you know, alcohol abuse or drug abuse or other forms of self-destruction. Heart attacks. You know, depression, yeah. anxiety, all okay. that kind of stuff. They say in my field, in, in palliative care, because I think that so few palliative care providers are working um, with an adequate supportive team structure, that 60 to 65 percent of palliative care providers are moderately to severely burned out. Okay. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. So I wanted to build something that was sustainable, that could grow to meet the unmet need, uh, and that looked like a pretty damn good time for me in trying to create a meaningful contribution to the world. Yeah. And so Resolution Care was born in 2014 on the basis of three simple ideas. One was that maybe these smartphones we have in our pockets are a tool for caring for people. Mm -hmm. Two, there was this uh, program called Project Echo out of the University of New Mexico that was a way of people with some expertise sharing that expertise with others as a way of sort of cloning their impact. Yeah, right? good. So I could teach people to do 80, 90% of what I do pretty easily and this Project Echo model was a model for doing that. And then the third thing was a crowdfunding campaign which um, a friend of mine who's a graphic designer needed a large format printer for her studio and she put it up uh, on a Kickstarter campaign and she ended up with twice the quality of device that she was looking for in about three weeks. Nice. And I was like, oh, what if I could gather some dollars from the community based on their understanding of my value over these 20 plus years I've been living here, put it to the initiation of a home-based palliative care program that uses technology and integrates with the University of New Mexico Project ECHO. What if I could do that? And by the end of that year, we launched a crowdfunding campaign, raised about $140,000, and five years ago, in January of 2015, we walked into an empty and donated office space. And from that point, it's I, it's been unbelievable <laughs> the uh, amount of well you're talking with enthusiasm and a smile on your face yeah. right now I'm sure it's been more than you thought but also rewarding in many ways I guess one of one of my questions when I was driving here and thinking about the work you do with people as they transition how has your uh, intimacy with the process of dying, how has that influenced your worldview? Hmm. That's a great, great question. I think it may be because I have in my guts as much or even more visceral fear of dying and mortality than other people. I don't know if it's more, but it's there. And I think that one of the reasons I choose to do this work is that I learned a long time ago to lean into the places I was most uncomfortable. Mm. And 
by leaning into and walking next to the most extraordinary individual human beings as they all navigate their way through in their own way. Some people do it with amazing grace and, you know, beatific healing and transformation. And other people go kicking and screaming. Yeah. But being next to people that are trying to figure that out for themselves always keeps my sort of attention on my own mortality so that I don't go too long without asking the question, Am, is what I'm doing or putting my energy toward in this life what I actually intend? Am I sleepwalking today through mm. my life? Am I doing what I think I should or ought to do? Or am I actively choosing how to balance my life, how to show up for my kids and my wife, how to show up for the colleagues that I've gathered together to build this thing? There's not too many hours that go by before I ask myself that question, are you choosing the life you're living? It's powerful forces you to walk with intention. You know, a lot of people have aging parents or they're thinking about these things themselves. What are some of the pieces of advice you would give to family members or people who are retirement age or the boomers? What are some pieces of that wisdom, advice, uh, maybe mentally, spiritually, uh, financially, legally, that you would give to, to people entering this space? Well, I, I used to have aging parents. Um, now I have dead ones. Um, my mom died sad about two years ago. And my dad died two weeks ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. Super happy. Thanks. I'm super happy and actually had pretty much manifested exactly the kind of finish to his life that he would have liked, um, that he did like okay. the last 20 years. Um, playing golf three times a week, bullshitting with the guys yeah. <laughs> over lunch, had a routine, a fantastic partner, his, uh, his uh, wife, and was really only sick over the last few months with prostate cancer that couldn't be pushed back. Um, he finished his life pretty solid uh, and didn't have, there wasn't a whole lot of drama or difficulty. He was blessed with a pretty smooth course. Um, so advice to other people with other parents Well, I don't think I'll give advice. I think what I'll tell you is this. These are the insights that came to me this last week about my dad. Um, I realized that my whole life I've had a place in my heart for him. Complicated relationship. Um, not Ozzie and Harriet. But not some horrible Jerry Springer show either. Yeah. You know, he was a good guy. Um, but I had this place in my heart where he lived that was all cluttered and full of confusion and memories, memories of a kid and memories of a bigger kid and memories of a teenager, memories of a young adult, all different meat forms of me remembering and processing a whole world of complicated things and ways of understanding him that were inaccurate and messy and in conflict and everything else. And what happened over the course of the last few months was that I cleaned the place in my heart where he lived. That he now has a place in my heart that's not cluttered, that isn't filled with boxes and mirrors and confusion. It's just a clean, light-filled space with my dad in it, just the man that he was, the life that he lived, without a lot of complexity and complication. And that shouldn't have to wait to the end for a son and a father. It could be possible that people can resolve themselves and let go of those projections and yeah. hurts and 
all that stuff long before a person's dad. But what I can say about my dad and I is that we looked at each other a few weeks ago and realized that we were, we were both proud of each other. And I didn't really quite wrap my head around what that really means for a father and a son or a mother and a daughter or a mother and a son. I mean, I, I'm not really sure, but in this situation, it was a father and a son. And it just seemed like that was like, that was the golden ring. We won the father-son game by coming to this place where we could look at each other and say, I'm proud of the man you are, dad. And him looking at me, I'm proud of the man you are, Michael. It was like, sense of completion. It would have been nice to clear the space and have those experiences a long time ago and for a long time. Yeah. The other thing I could say that my dad that maybe sounds like advice is with these gizmos that we carry around in our pocket, you don't need a special digital microphone and camera to sit down across the table and ask your dad or your kids some questions. So I have a series of about 30 minutes of video that I shot with him at the end of last year with him just sitting across the table in a pretty easygoing night. I just asked him to tell me stories about his days in the service or whatever he wanted to talk about and just invited him to become reflective and really honest with himself. And then I didn't, I didn't do much in the way of interviewing. I just turned on the camera. I didn't tell him I was oh, turning really? on the camera <laughs> <laughs> until you, afterwards. Do you plan to go back and look at those anytime I, soon? Have yeah, you? no, this last week since he died, yeah, okay. I looked them all over. So it's been a comfort. Felt it with him just solidly in the sort of period of completing of his life and then shared that with his wife, my sisters, his, his sister, some cousins, and it was a powerful part of this last week. I just got back from Florida where we had his memorial. And so everybody had had a chance to look at those things and everybody had a chance to like, like drop in to the actual person that was no longer with us, right. not the projected person. Yeah. So it was really good to have those kinds of images. So play with your smartphones, interview your grandparents, interview your parents. Um, just ask a few simple questions. Perfect. What what type of people are you bringing into this office? What uh yeah, who are you serving in the community? Yeah, and so, how can they work with you? So um, palliative care is a specialty of medicine, real real life specialty. Um, that functions through providing a team, an interdisciplinary team of individuals to focus on improving the quality of life and quality of experience for people with very serious illnesses. Um, people sometimes have serious illnesses and then get better. So it's not necessarily someone with a terminal diagnosis. That's right. It can, okay. it can be incredibly valuable at any stage of life. Okay. In fact, I just said so long and graduated a fellow um, and we've been caring for him for uh, about a year and a half and he's just done really really well and is now sort of back in a new state of normal so off he goes into the community and we'll make room for Sounds somebody like, else to come like in. it's a successful formula there. very successful formula and for some people let's say with cancer some cancers take a really toll on you while you're being treated but can provide a cure and so we can be really useful during that period of intensive treatment while people are struggling with the mortality. The mortality is what scares them yeah. and all the symptoms and all the impact that it has on everything they thought their life was supposed to look like. We can help them for three months, six months, 12 months while they're navigating that. And then when they're done and have every chance of having a cure, they can move out from our program, right? Quite a lot of the people that we care for have progressive illness, illness that's not going to go away. And in fact, it's going to progressively worsen over time. And for those people, a lot of those folks 
uh, leave our practice and our handed into the care of hospice when they enter that end of life phase where their interest is purely on comfort from symptoms and not directed towards their illness or disease or pushing it back. So do you have some sort of counselor or spiritual counseling totally, for these people? Good. Totally. Good. No, I mean, our whole crew are, can be characterized as being very spiritual in nature, uh, very justice and social yeah, yeah. kind of... I saw you're a B Corp. Yeah, right. we're a B Corp. Yeah. And we believe in sustainability and re- good relationships with all of the stakeholders, not just the people who provided investment money mm-hmm. for us. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have on our team a doctor, a nurse, or nurse practitioner, um, social worker, a community health worker, spiritual counselor, and a care coordinator. Each person under our care has those individuals assigned, that interprofessional awesome. team. And so those individuals all bring the knowledge that comes from each of those special points of view and trainings, but they also bring the unique and individual humanity of each of them into it. And we recognize that both of those things are essentially equally important. Like a nurse has to know a lot about medications and how people manage and stay on track of their medications. But each individual nurse brings a whole life experience. And that's as important. Same with our community health workers, our care coordinators. We have a fairly flat and integrated team-based approach to figuring out how to support each individual person under our care in their own terms, on their own, on their own terms. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything you're doing for this community. I hope this interview helps more people find you totally. and learn about you. Well, but- I'll just invite people to visit us at www.resolutioncare.com. Um, please sign up for a newsletter. We don't send out much crap. <laughs> We send out pretty good stuff, stories, videos that uh, people under our care have wanted to share, um, occasional news items, and then probably once a year we ask for people to consider making donations. Uh, but we don't, we don't, and we don't sell our list or anything like that. So www.resolutioncare.com, and there's a lot of uh, amazing content on that site for people. Um, and then if anybody does have a million dollars, $10 million lying around and they want to find some place to put it to work, they can uh, give us a call and send me an email at uh, info at resolutioncare.com. We will accept donations of millions of dollars if yeah. they happen to be well, this coming is a, our way. Certainly a good cause. <laughs> Until then, we're just going to keep doing our thing and figuring out how to make this operation work. Right. Thank you so much for your time. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Appreciate it.